everybody for joining today. Uh, this is uh, a overview of the SBIR STTR program and hopefully when we're done today, you'll kind of be able to answer the question, um, is this program right for you? So uh, very high level um, over overview of the program. Um, we're going to talk about eligibility and program statistics to give you a sense of who participates in the program. Um, talk a little bit about what's the difference between SBIR and STTR, look at grants versus contracts and some specific topics for SBIR opportunities. We'll quickly look at the participating agencies and do a little bit of a deeper dive into the top handful. And then talk about what to expect when you're preparing a proposal. Um, there'll be time for questions at the end. In addition, throughout the presentation, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat box or raise your hand or, or however the easiest way is for you. I'm a super casual presenter, so we can stop and address questions as we go. Um, I cannot see my comment screen, so Kathy will moderate those for me. <clears throat> okay, before um, I start, I, I typically like to, to just share a couple of kind of rules for the presentation. The first is that uh, what I'm gonna share with you today are the basic rules of the program. Um, this is a program that is run and implemented by human beings who have been given the authority to make exceptions. And so I have no doubt that there's probably an exception to almost everything I'm gonna tell you about today. And you may even know some of those people who have been those exceptions, um, but these are the basic rules of the program. Um, so things do happen outside of the, that, but that's not what we're gonna talk about today. Um, expect to be overwhelmed. This is a, a, a super complex program. Um, it's layered in federal, federal bureaucracy. Um, I have made a full-time living off of helping people navigate this for 20 years. So it's, it's overwhelming. Uh, so it's natural to feel like that. And there's no way to sort of slowly introduce you to it. So I just kind of like throw it all at you, see what sticks, and then let me know if you have any questions. Um, <clears throat> every agency is different. Uh, so when we talk about SBIR, <clears throat> excuse me, and STTR, we're talking about these 11 federal agencies that participate in the program, but each one of those agencies is different. So don't make any assumptions. If you have submitted an NIH proposal, SBI proposal, it is nothing like submitting a USDA uh, SBIR proposal. So um, every time you uh, start working with a new agency, you need to revisit all the rules. <clears throat> of course, the subject of the future of the program is always subject to change because it's a federal program. Um, but I, there's no, for several years, we were operating on a continuing resolution. That's not the case now. Um, things are a little bit more stable. Um, you may be frustrated when you ask questions because most of the time my answer will be, it depends. Um, lots of uh, answers here are circumstantial and uh, depend on a number of factors. So I'll do my best to answer based on your situation, but um, most of the time it's going to be it depends. Finally, when I say SBIR, I also mean STTR. Sometimes it's just easier to say SBIR. Um, STTR is the smaller sister program. And as you'll see, not all agencies have STTR, but when it applies, I also mean STTR. All right, so let's look at the um, eligibility requirements. Um, first of all, the SBIR program is the Small Business Innovation Research Program. And again, the smaller sister program is the Small Business Technology Transfer Program. They're very similar. The main difference is that SBIR was developed to uh, promote technical innovation and commercialize that among small businesses. STTR was the same, but also in cooperation with research institutions. So uh, that is really designed to encourage partnerships between research institutions and small businesses to move technology forward. SBIR is a set aside program based on extramural research budgets. So once they hit this threshold of spending of money going out the door for research, an agency must participate in the program and it's a set aside. And why that's important for you to know is there are other opportunities within most of these agencies to get funding, but SBIR, STTR is the only program where you're only competing against other small businesses. Um, so if you're familiar with the NIH uh, activity codes, you know, you could do an R01, you could do an R21, uh, but you'll be competing against other academic researchers. In SBIR, you're only competing against other businesses. 
It was formed in 1982 as part of the Small Business Innovation Development Act. Um, lots of uh, actually um, government prime contractors had problems that they couldn't solve that were not worthy of their time and investment to solve. But the small business uh, um, sector just hated doing business with the government. And so this program was designed and developed to uh, allow small businesses to maintain a little bit more autonomy and make it a little bit more palatable to do business with the federal government. Uh, the awards, actually now the awards total over $3 billion a year in non-dilutive funding. Um, and we'll dive a little deeper into that in a second. And again, this program is designed to stimulate R&D and innovation uh, of new technologies to meet the needs of the public, which it does through grants and then federal agencies, which it does through contracts. And we'll explore the difference between grants and contracts in a little bit. To be eligible for the program, you, your company, you must be a company. First of all, you must have a company. It must be for profit, uh, have fewer than 500 employees, including affiliates located and primarily operate in the United States and be more than 50% owned and operated by US citizens or permanent residents or owned and controlled by one for-profit small business that is more than 50% controlled or operated by US citizens or residents. Now that uh, affiliates clause is really important, especially when we're talking about startups that may receive uh, investment from outside organizations. Uh, the example I like to use with this is I had a client who um, was a university faculty member who started a client and a very large hospital chain invested in the startup they held less than 50% ownership. They held uh, just, uh, just about 40%, uh, but the SBA ruled that that was considered an affiliate and therefore the small business had to include the large hospital chains employees as, as their affiliates and it knocked them out of eligibility. So just pay close attention to that affiliates rule. Um, I'm a super visual person, so um, I like this slide because it shows you the complexity of the program visually. So first, the very top, the gray box, shows that Congress enacts the legislation that supports the, S the SBIR program. That is given to the SBA to administer the program. They prepare a directorate, and underneath that are the 11 federal agencies. So all of those green boxes are the 11 fe federal agencies. Underneath each agency, there are subcategories or components. So people often refer to the Department of Defense. Well, what does that really mean in SBIR? It means the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, SOCOM, MDA, and several other components. When people say NIH, what they really mean is the Department of Health and Human Services. NIH is one subset of the Department of Health and Human Services. And within NIH, there are additional 24 institutes and centers that participate in SBIR. NIH has 27 institutes and centers, not all of them participate in, in SBIR. Very similar over here with the other, uh, with Department of Commerce, for example, that includes NIST and NOAA. Um, so again, lots of layers of government bureaucracy. Um, SBIR is a three phase program and the majority of the time you're going to want to go phase one, phase two, phase three. There are some exceptions and I'll talk about that on the next slide. But phase one is focused on feasibility. So generally we're talking about answering two questions, two groups of questions. The first is technically does it work and can you build it? And the second that might not be applicable to your program, but the majority of the time it is or to your project is uh, do they like it and will they use it? Um, and so at the end of your phase one, simply think of it as a red or green light, a go or no go. Um, this is very uh, preliminary research, or I shouldn't use that word. Um, this is very early, er, pretty early research in the commercialization process to make sure that this is going to be able to gain traction. You're typically talking about $150,000 uh, for the project that varies by agency, um, some agencies, like NIH can go up to 300,000. NSF has a hard cap at 256,000. So it just varies by agency. Uh, typically your project period is six to nine months for an SBIR, for an STTR, the typical project period is one year. After phase one, you move to phase two, which is focused on prototyping. 
This is about a million dollars a year more, depending on the agency. Um, typically a two year project period. Uh, and at the end of this, you're sort of expected to have a prototype. Now this prototype can vary from very sophisticated if you have a shorter pathway to commercialization. But if you're developing a therapeutic or even a medical device, your prototype at this point may be relatively rudimentary. So that, that definition of prototype varies depending on your project. In between phase two and phase three, there's a variety of other funding mechanisms depending on the agency and your specific solicitation. Um, those are sometimes referred to as phase two B funding or bridge funding awards. And then phase three is commercialization. Um, there are no SBIR funds available for commercialization. However, if you're doing a contract in commercialization, the agency takes money from a different pot and uh, you become a sole source uh, provider of that, that uh, product or service. All right, again, the best option is to go phase one, phase two, phase three. Um, there are other options that exist that people are often very tempted by. Uh, for example, the fast track in which you're proposing a phase one and a phase two all together. The direct to phase two, which is when you skip phase one, and then phase 2B and administrative supplements, those are additional funding after you get your, your phase one. A couple of uh, thoughts on the fast track. This is one of my least favorite mechanisms. I would almost never recommend it to a business that has not had an SBIR before, that doesn't have already a funding uh, history with an agency. Um, you're talking about planning out three years worth of R&D, um, which in my mind is virtually impossible given how rapidly technology develops today. Now, if you're, if you're developing a, a, a drug, you know, maybe that has a very clear path to market and you know, with drug development, you go A, B, C, D. But if you're developing a technology that uses, for example, artificial intelligence, there's no way that the approach you use today would be the same as you would in three years. The technology is just evolving too rapidly. So a fast track, I think is a really bad idea. You can also achieve almost the same thing if you time your phase one and phase two right. Um, so you have a relatively seamless transition between the two. Um, direct to phase two often seems tempting to people because they say, oh, well, we're past feasibility. Most of the time we can find something that you still need to uh, demonstrate feasibility on. Um, so very few people are actually that as far along as they think they are. Um, one example of an appropriate direct to phase two was I had a client who uh, had a medical device that had been, uh, he conducted three clinical trials in Europe, uh, but the FDA wanted US based data. And so because it had already been in humans um, in Europe and he already had an extensive amount of data, that made sense as a direct to phase two. But again, not usually the case. The, the analogy I like to use about phase one, phase two is phase one is sort of the dating phase. And that's, you're dating, you're dating the government and they're dating you. So you're both kind of feeling each other out. As a company, do you want to spend time on federal grants? It's, it's not a walk in the park. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Um, is this a good investment of your team's time? And from the agency perspective, do you turn your reports in on time? Are you, um, do you have good fiscal management policies? Did you do the work you said you were going to do? If the answer to, to yes is both on both of those fronts, then you both move on to phase two, which is when you kind of more or less get married um, or just kind of move in together like kids do today, I guess. All right, so why would somebody participate in SBIR or STTR? Well, first of all, it allows the business to maintain control of operations and it allows you to maintain all of your intellectual property rights. Um, remember I said this was created because um, small business didn't want to do business with the government. Well, the government used to, to um, swap up all of your intellectual property rights. No longer the case, um, you maintain your intellectual property. It allows you to safely explore new ideas and reduces risk for other outside investors. Um, so it puts the risk on the government um, instead of you or your other investors. And speaking of risks, it requires an inherent sense of risk. Um, they expect that there will be failures, and, and sometimes those failures may be projects that you have proposed. 
Finally, the success rate is greater um, than it is with other sources of funding. Um, I had a startup and, and did the whole dog and pony show with uh, venture investors and it's incredibly time consuming um, and uh, you're prone to receive the slow no. Um, and this is just a much better route, at least while you're doing that, that uh, venture investment, you might as well have an SBIR percolating in the background. Okay, so a look at who wins. Again, we're talking about 11 federal agencies who issue over 36 solicitations, and they accept more than 19,000 phase one proposals in the year. Um, in 2019, which is the last year we have whole data for, um, they made over 4,500 phase one awards to uh, almost 3,000 firms. So you can see some firms get more than one award. Um, once you get one award, it becomes a lot easier to get subsequent awards. If we average all of the agencies together, you're looking at about a 17% award rate on phase one submissions. And for phase two, that, that goes up to about 60%, a little lower for some agencies. NIH is running a little bit lower for phase two submissions. Um, but some agencies claim, I, I don't have any statistics to back this up, but for example, National Science Foundation claims if you participate in their i program, your phase two award rate goes up to as high as 75 to 80%. 40% of the companies that win have between two and nine employees. So this truly is a program for small business. Here's a look um, at what's happening in your state. And next we'll look at the region for comparison. Um, but again, in 2019, you had $53 million in SBIR awards in your state, and you had $14 million in STTR awards. Now we'll talk about the difference between SBIR and STTR in a bit, but based on the rules, that means a minimum of $4.2 million went back to your research institutions to invest in um, research in their labs. Over on the right are a couple of uh, uh, successful SBIR applicants from Illinois. These are both companies based out of Matter in Chicago um, and had both received phase one awards. Here's a look at the region. Um, so you can see who the big winner is, right? I live in Indiana, so I'm over here with 22 million, which 22 million pales in comparison to your 53 million. Um, the real winner right here is Ohio. And if we were all together, I would ask you to sort of shout out reasons why you think Ohio leads the region. Um, but since we're virtual, I'll just go ahead and, and spoil it for you. Um, and that's because they have an asset that the rest of us don't have, uh, which, which is Wright Pat Air Force Base. And so anywhere there's a major military installation, you're going to see a state that has significant awards like that because of sort of the bleed out of research and development that's happening around that, that base. All right, any questions so far? Okay, guess that's a good sign. All right, so what's the difference between SBIR and STTR and what does it fund? We'll look at some projects too. So SBIR allows the company, remember the company is always the primary applicant, allows the company to partner with a research institution. STTR requires it. And then this little graph on the bottom here on the left is a, a visual representation of the required splits. So for an SBIR, the company must do the majority of the work, which is defined as two thirds of the work. The company could do 100%. You could keep all the money inside the company if you wanted. You are permitted to send up to one third of the total award out the door to a sub award. For an SB, uh, STTR, the company must do 40% of the work. And then one research institution must do a minimum of 30% of the work, which leaves that gray box an additional 30, and that can go to either one of those, either the research institution or the company, or it can go to somebody totally different. Um, to give you a sense of these splits, what happens is, for example, if you're doing a multi-site clinical trial, the company would need to have 40% 
at least one clinical site would need to have 30%, and that would leave 30% to split among the other sites. And that's because there needs to be at least one subaward site that serves as the lead subaward site, which is, is determined by NIH to be that 30% split. Now, effort is, is measured in time and money. And so um, it's one thing to have a budget that shows that 60%, 66% of the work is happening at the company or the money is staying in the company. But similarly, when a, when a reviewer reads your research plan, there should be tasks and, and um, required uh, experiments or studies or whatever happening that are led by company employees. If a reviewer is reading your research plan and everything they see is happening at a university, but the university only gets 33% of the budget, those two things don't align. So effort is, is measured in time and money. Um, again, SBIR phase one is usually six months, while STTR is typically one year. And in both instances, excuse me, I, I'm sorry, in, in no matter what the time frame of your project is, um, the minimum required effort of the principal investigator is 10%. So they must allocate 10% of their time either over a six month period or a one year period to the phase one project. Now, a major difference between SBIR and STTR is that in SBIR, the principal investigator or the lead on the project must be more than 50% employed by the company at time of award. They only have to spend 10% of their time on the project, but they have to be employed by the company more than 50% at time of award. On an STTR, the principal investigator can live at the research institution or the company. Now, the STTR is, is the mechanism that we use most often when you're talking about a university faculty member who has a startup that they've spun out they don't want to leave their position at the university and go to work full time at the company. And so the STTR allows them to serve as the principal investigator through a sub award to the university. But remember, the company is always the applicant, always the applicant. All right, so here are the four things that I say that you have to have to have to even these, these are the non starters right so you have to have innovation. Um, and this is not incremental improvement. This has to be something new that has the potential to be disruptive. Um, it can be building a better mousetrap, but the better has to be better enough to cause change in behavior. Um, so, you know, if you have a, um, a new type of um, uh, hand sanitizer, you know, that's, that's purple instead of clear, um, well, it, it better performs so much better that it'll make me as a consumer stop buying all of the clear that I've bought for 10 years and that I have all over my house and instead buy the purple. Uh, so that, that disruption has to be great enough to change behavior. There has to be commercial potential. Um, so this program is not about doing cool research for the sake of doing cool research. This is about doing cool research for the sake of commercialization. Um, and you need to be able to identify that market even in phase one, you have to know who your customer is, who the buyer is, who the end user is, which by the way, mean maybe all different people. Um, and you have to have an understanding of that market and how that works. There needs to be phased development. Um, you need to be able to go phase one, phase two, phase three. And the other, the reason is because the only reason we do phase one really is to get to phase two. Um, we all know that $150,000 is not enough to do uh, substantial, meaningful work, but a million, a million and a half can get you pretty far. Um, so we have to do phase one to get to phase two. If your project is not well suited for that phased development, this might not be the right program for you. Um, and then you need to have a structured team. You need to have structure in place. You need to have a solid team. Um, with a principal investigator who has the appropriate experience. You have to have a company formed um, and you have to have identified partners and collaborators and experts in the commercial market. Um, so you kind of have to have that, that structure together. Back in the old days, um, when we mailed in applications, you did not even have to have the company formed, but now because everything is done electronically, um, you're required to have the company formed before you even submit. Here's what National Science Foundation says makes a good SBIR. I like the, these uh, points. 
Um, I think they're, they give great insight into the sort of approach of the program. I will caution you that NSF is um, the most, uh, the agency that, that embraces risk the most. Um, NIH is much more risk adverse than NSF. And so um, they have, for example, um, NSF likes high risk technology that's unproven. Well, Shelly and I were just talking in, a, in an earlier workshop that I, I've never seen an NIH get funded that didn't have solid preliminary uh, evidence. So um, NIH is not into that, that high of a risk. If you have something super risky, NSF might be a great agency for you. Nonetheless, I like the way they describe it. All right, here's a look at a couple of projects um, that were funded, just to give you a sense of, of what they look for. Um, I think these are all NIH. I'll let you know if they're not. Um, one was an alternative device for cervical insufficiency, um, which hasn't evolved in 50 years. Uh, this is a, a OBGYN from Tufts University who started a company to, and he came up with a new way um, to do this, this uh, current standard of care is called a cerclage, which is essentially a stitch of the cervix. Um, but there are a lot of complications with that. And he, he created this better, safer, cheaper method of doing surgical cerclage. Uh, this, the picture is the next one. Um, this is a technology developed specifically to license to major trauma suppliers. So this uh, principal investigator, the company founder has no intentions of, you know, sort of selling these to the public. He wants this to be acquired by a trauma supplier. Um, and this is a product used for internal fixation surgeries of intermedullary nails. So if you fracture your femur and they put a metal rod in there, they have to put a nail. Uh, and this device combines the, the um, screw and the x-ray all in one. Um, so it reduces exposure to radiation. It makes the, project, the um, process more accurate and reduces complications. He uh, just, he is submitted a phase two, got, got denied and is resubmitting his phase two for September 5th. So we'll see, we'll see how that goes. Um, then a smart medical device for cloud-based data repository to enhance um, the way that asthma and COPD take pa patients take their inhaled medications. Um, apparently something like 90% of the people who have asthma use their inhaler wrong. So this was a smart device to sort of provide uh, track data and, and provide tutorials. So those are some sample projects. Any questions popping up in the chat? Nope, I don't see any right now. Okay. All right, so let's talk grants versus contracts. So some agencies are granting agencies um, and that means that they have a problem to solve, um, but, but they will not be your customer. They will never be your customer. Um, and they will also tell, not tell you how to solve the problem. Um, then some agencies are contracting agencies um, where they have a problem to solve. You will be their supplier or they will be your customer and they give you very specific instructions on how they want the problem solved. That's a contracting agency. Some are one, but act like another or talk like another. Um, and then some agencies are both like NIH. NIH is primarily a granting agency but they issue one contract solicitation for SBIR each year. So grants generally encourage you to build a relationship with the program manager or program officer. Um, I started my career as a very traditional fundraiser and the number one rule in fundraising is people give money to people. And while your program officer is not necessarily the person who decides if your proposal gets funding or not, or is recommended for funding, if it comes down to your proposal and another proposal and he or she could only award one, they're gonna award it to the person they know because they feel more comfortable with that person. Um, we're all more comfortable with the, no, with the known versus the unknown. And so if they're like, oh, I don't know, you know, I mean, I know Dave, I've talked to Dave several times. I think he's really smart, but I, I don't know, you know, Steve, then he's going to give it to Dave. Um, so that's why it's really important to build that relationship with them. 
doesn't always work. It's not always perfect. They're not always willing to return phone calls or emails, but um, you need to at least, you know, give it the old college try. Contracts, on the other hand, have very strict rules about blackout periods and about contact with program officers. If you've ever submitted a, um, uh, like a, a sealed bid, it's very similar to that. Um, everything is either done in secret by the agency or in public. Um, so everybody has full transparency. For grants, uh, the staff is allowed to sort of review some of your materials if they're willing and give some, some general advice. Typically, if we're talking about NIH, that means you might send a program officer your specific aims page and say, you know, this is what we're thinking about proposing for the next deadline. Does this meet what your agency, you know, seems to be interested in? Um, and typically they'll provide feedback. Again, not the case with contracts. You are not permitted to do that. Now, during the project period of a grant, the agency is totally hands off. So they say, oh my gosh, this sounds like so much fun. You go do it. You come back and tell us how it went. A contract gives you the money and says, okay, be at my office Monday at 8 a.m. So um, totally different approach to the way that the uh, projects are actually executed. One's not better than the other necessarily. I guess it just depends on, on what you prefer, but uh, contracts have very specific um, requirements for how to complete the work. In addition, a, a lot of times with contracts, the contractor, the agency has information that or materials and supplies that you need to better understand the problem. Um, and so if you think about, uh, I had a, a client that was developing a um, special insole for shoes that delivered active compression um, to the sole of the foot to move blood. Um, and, you know, they worked with Under Armour on, on tennis shoes, but they did not have access to a uh, army issued boot. And so if they got the contract, they needed the army to give them the boot um, so they could, they could test it. Grants are never your end customer. Again, contracts are, um, in theory, the federal government or the Department of Defense. If you had a successful phase one and phase two contract by phase three, uh, you would become the sole source provider. For grants, unfunded proposals can be resubmitted. Um, for contracts, that's usually not the case because topics tend to appear and then never appear again. And for grants, those topics tend to be uh, very broad and open for long periods of time. Okay, if there's no question, if there's questions, let me know. Otherwise, we'll move on to participating agencies. All right, again, looking at our 2019 data, um, I've ranked the agencies by size. Um, the largest is Department of Defense at 1.6 billion, and the smallest is EPA at just under 5.5 million. I like the next slide better because it's graphic. Oh, shoot, I don't have it in this presentation. Darn it. Well, I have a pie chart that shows what that really looks like. And essentially, it's the Department of Defense taking over half of the entire program. Um, so it it trumps the, the next smallest program by, by half or double. So let's look at Department of Defense very briefly. Um, now, they typically issue three solicitations per year. But now they're on this big kick where they uh, issue what we call out of cycle um, solicitations um, and they tend to come all throughout the year. They still do issue those big solicitations three times a year, but they're, that's not the only opportunity. They are all contracts. They have extremely focused topic areas and we'll look at a topic in just a second. They do operate under that pre-release period where um, you know, topics are released six weeks before they're considered to be open um, and they're kind of, the terminology is on the street um, and it allows you to look at them and then submit questions on this public portal. You used to be able to email individuals and they'd email you back. Now you can't even do that. It all has to be public. It is a firm fixed price. So there's, um, they're pretty specific on the pricing. There's not a lot of room for negotiation there. They do um, uh, review their own proposals internally with technical experts. Um, and they really have a wide range of topics, um, not under SBIR, but under other funding mechanisms. The Army is actually the largest funder of breast cancer research in the federal government. Um, so it's not always what you think it's gonna be for, for Department of Defense. Sometimes there's some real wacky stuff. 
Um, so anyway, they have 13 separate components. So when we say Department of Defense, we actually mean 13 smaller components like Army, Navy, Air Force, SOCOM, MDA. They do not allow participation by companies who have any VC investment at all. Um, and again, they have those new flexible top topics. Um, Air Force has launched something called AFWORKS. You may have heard of that, um, where they actually award a smaller amount of money. It's a very short sprint. Um, you submit a essentially a pitch deck as your proposal, um, and they allow these very wide, broad topics, which is, again, a, a big shift for Department of Defense. Oh, I should say, too, uh, Department of Defense, if you remember that regional map that had Ohio and, you know, it was like smoking all of us by like five times in their awards, because they have that right pat there, <clears throat> excuse me, Department of Defense makes 73% of their awards uh, to 10 states. Um, and, and Illinois is not one of them, and neither is Indiana, but Ohio is. So I'm guessing you can, you can figure out most of those 10 states have large military installations. Doesn't mean you shouldn't try, just, it's just a numbers fact. All right, Health and Human Services includes NIH, FDA, and CDC. NIH is the biggest of those um, sub-agencies. NIH offers SBIR and STTR. FDA and CDC do not offer STTR. They are too small. They're SBIR only. Uh, grants um, for NIH, they have um, varying solicitations. There's what they call the omnibus, which is just pretty much if you're working on public health, you don't even really need to find a topic. You can send it in. Uh, but then they offer also, also offer special solicitations that are more um, specific and uh, you typically have like a particular disease state or uh, you know, a more specific problem they're trying to solve, but they're also grants. Um, their topics are what we call investigator initiated. And that's very common in grants. That's how we refer to most of the topics in grants are investigator initiated. So the agency provides this huge like general topic, you know, like uh, therapies for COPD. And then it's up to the investigator to sort of determine what specifically that means to them and what they want to look at and how they want to execute it. Um, contracts are the opposite. Um, they're very narrow. Uh, let's see. Again, NIH has 24 institutes and centers and resubmissions are not only permitted, but almost always going to be required. It's very unlikely that you will get funded on your first submission to NIH. National Science Foundation, um, they just went to a new model last year. Uh, they have rolling deadlines and they now require a project pitch, which I actually like because it presents a really low barrier of entry for folks. So the first step is you don't even have to have the company formed. You go online, you fill out four boxes that total 2000 words and you submit it, and then they let you know if you're invited to submit a full proposal or not. If you are invited, you have one year to do it. And so a lot of times I say like, well, why not put the pitch in? And then you can decide if you actually want to do it. So if you're thinking NIH or NSF at all, excuse me, NSF at all, then go ahead and submit a pitch and see, see what they say. If your pitch gets rejected, no problem. You can iterate on it, try again. Um, and, and until you either give up or, or get invited. Um, they are grants, but they do like to use some contracting language. They are investigator initiated broad topics again, and we'll look at some in just a second. Um, contact with the staff is permitted, but the first step is always going to be the project pitch. So staff is reluctant to talk to you if you haven't already submitted a pitch. They have a firm 256 ceiling on a phase one. So you cannot ask for a penny over 256,000. Um, in fact, I'm helping somebody with some, uh, if you're about to get awarded, the agency often comes back and asks for changes. And NSF made me lower um, two numbers in the budget by $1 um, to ensure that we didn't go over um, like a rounding thing. So. Um, I probably should have known most federal agencies round down, not up. Um, so we had to change it by a dollar. Even though the budget was still 256,000, they, they wanted it under a dollar. Um, you submit through their own portal that's called Fastlane. It's really called research.gov. They're transitioning Fastlane to research.gov, but it's just taking a long time for SBIR to get over there. Resubmissions are permitted. Um, and again, 
it, it's not unlikely that you'll have to submit more than once. Oh, uh, one fact about NSF. Remember I talked about the rules for STTR. The principal investigator is allowed to live at the research institution um, and, and not the company. And for an SBIR, the principal investigator must be at the company. Well, the, the exception to that rule is NSF. For NSF, even on an STTR, the principal investigator must be more than 50% employed by the company. The, the lead at the research institution cannot hold any equity in that company. Uh, so typically that means if you're a faculty member and you have a startup and you want to submit an NSF and you wanna be the principal investigator without leading, leaving your, your faculty position, that's not gonna work. Um, you're, you can be on the project as a co-investigator, but you're going to have to find somebody else to be the principal investigator. All right. Any uh, any questions so far on that? I do have a couple of questions, and um, it's not regarding the previous slides, but let me just see here. I, I wrote them down. Um, in regards to the project pitch, um, if you have multiple ideas, I have multiple ideas. Yeah. Can I submit it in one project pitch or do I have no. to submit it in separate? Submit submit a, a one project pitch for each idea and you can only have one pitch pending at a time. Oh gosh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> but they typically get back to you pretty quickly, so. Okay, and um, this was the the earlier slides when you were talking about the percentage of the awards that were allocated. So out of the awards that were allocated, what's the percentage rate that awards were designated for small businesses? Were there bigger firm, forms, firms? Uh, do you that, have that data? That's, that's all small business. All small business. Oh, yep. that's good. Yep. Remember it's a set aside. So that's what that, it's that 3.2 billion is set aside and only small business can compete in there. Oh, wow. That's yeah. really encouraging. It is very. Now I'm kind of confused with the private investigator. Um, so they can be from the agency or they can be part of the company, like your company. The is principal that the principal investigator either needs to live at the company or when I say research institution, I typically mean a university partner. Oh, I get what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. But even if the principal investigator is at the, the research institution, the company still has to have somebody to do work on the project. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Those are all good questions. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Hello. I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, in terms of partnering with research institutions, do people typically do that before they're making their project pitch, or is that something that you kind of get immersed in if you were awarded a grant? Um, well, if you're doing NSF and you're doing a project pitch, um, I would recommend you have that relationship already established and be able to talk about, you know, we're going to work with um, you know, XYZ University on this. Um, if you're talking about submitting a proposal, you absolutely have to have that relationship already established when you submit the proposal. Um, if you're working with a research institution or we'll say university um, and you're submitting a proposal, there's required documentation that must be routed and approved by that university to be included in your proposal. So you need to have those, those um, partners in advance. Similarly, I mean, this is more phase two, but, you know, somebody came to me and wanted to do a phase two clinical trial, multi-site clinical trial, but they, they didn't have the sites picked out yet. Well, you, you can't submit a proposal to do a, a clinical trial at sites and not know the sites. Okay. Um, there's just too many variables and um, it takes too long to establish those things during the project period. So you have to have it done up front. How about like, uh, are there any good resources to like uh, help find partners in, in the federal government? Like uh, through, through the departments of energy's national laboratories like Fermilab and Argon Lab and these sorts of things? Well, you can actually partner with, with uh, national labs. That, that, that is possible. Um, and I think that, you know, the best way to find folks like that is uh, Google. 
Um, and what you're really looking for um, most of the time are people who are leading the industry in publications. And so, if, for example, NIH, if you're going to try to find a, um, you know, somebody in your field and, you know, who's big on rotavirus, you know, then you go to their library of publications. It's called PubMed and you type in rotavirus and you see who's publishing on that. Um, as far as national labs, to be totally honest with you, that is, that is not, I don't work a lot in um, Department of Energy, which uses a lot of national labs. Um, that's not one of the agencies where I spend the majority of my time. Shelly, I see you on here. Do you have any experience with working with a national, I know you need a CRADA, um, but I don't do a lot of national lab proposals, do you? I don't either. The, yeah, DOE I know uses a lot and that's not really my area of specialty. Yeah. 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 So, and, and honestly, I mean, you'd be shocked at, at how, um, you know, I've certainly tried to help clients find uh, clinical partners on projects and we simply prepare a one pager and reach out via email and say, here's the project we're working on. Do you have any interest in being involved? Can we schedule a call? And I'd say 50% of the time we're successful in getting a call, which is, you know, the first step. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, uh, question. So I have a question regarding that, how many submissions per agency you can do. So let us let me ask about NSF. You said there at any given time, there can be only one pending uh, submission, if I got correctly. There can only be one pending pitch to NSF. That's correct. So if suppose you have one, pen, you have one proposal which has been uh, granted, like uh, you got yeah. that money, right? Then you can submit one more, right? Yes, yes, yes. If it's awarded, that's fine. You could have one pitch pending and one proposal pending, but you can't have, you're not allowed to submit more than one proposal at a time, and you're not allowed to submit more than one pitch at a time. And so okay. as long as your ones cross those categories, so you could have a pitch pending, you could have a proposal pending, and you could have a funded proposal. That's all legit. That's all allowed. Okay. And that, that's true for other agencies as well? No, that's just, remember that it varies by agency. <laughs> um, right. So that, that varies by agency. So NIH doesn't really have a restriction on that, except for everything that you propose must be different enough. Um, right. And so typically... Um, we don't like to submit more than one proposal to NIH that would be going to the same study section. So that doesn't always mean, you know, you could potentially submit two that have to do with cancer as long as we got them to, to two separate review panels. You don't okay. want a, a group of reviewers sitting around reviewing three of your proposals at a time. That, that doesn't go over very well. Makes sense. Thank you very much. You're Thanks. welcome. All good questions, you guys. Great questions. Okay, let's. I'm going to just briefly touch on um, what to expect when you, if you decide to prepare your proposal. First, no matter what agency you're submitting to, uh, the re the re registrations on the left are required. So, no matter what you're submitting to, you must have an EIN number or a TIN, tax identification number, employee identification number that's granted by the IRS. Um, you must have a DUNS number. And you must be registered and active on SAM, which is System for Award Management. Um, SAM, EIN is like immediate. DUNS is like 24, 48 hours. SAM can take four to six weeks and sometimes has to be submitted more than once. And so if you're thinking about thinking about thinking about submitting a proposal, go ahead and register your company on SAM. And then uh, all small businesses must register on, who do SBIR, must register on sbir.gov, which is SBA's repository for um, data and tracking of SBIRs. By the way, you can go to sbir.gov and search funded uh, abstracts of funded proposals, uh, which is also another great way to give you ideas for what types of projects uh, are a good fit for SBIR. You can search by state, by year, by agency. You can do all kinds of things and that abstract pops up and you can read the abstract. Depending on which agency you're applying to, you may have to register at any one of these on the right side. 
Um, Grants.gov is the portal used for all grants that are submitted to the federal government. Um, ERA Commons is NIH's platform for communication and ERA Commons offers an, a proposal submission platform called Assist, um, which you're, allows you to skip Grants.gov, which I prefer. Um, research.gov is NSF, so it just sort of depends on what agency you're applying for, but you have to have the four on the left no matter what. Um, okay, so this is just a quick look at NSF versus NIH. Um, oh, darn it, I forgot to fix that. An NSF technical proposal is 15 pages, um, and NIH is one page for specific aims and six pages for research strategy. So you can see that's seven pages versus 15 pages. Totally different approach to writing your proposals. NSF is heavy on commercialization. The first half of your proposal is commercialization, even in phase one. In NIH, we might include a paragraph on commercialization, maybe a paragraph, at least like three or five sentences and that's it. Um, they both require biosketches. They both require some form of an abstract or summary. They both require uh, some form of facilities and other equipment. They both require references cited, which are very important. And um, I can guarantee you that if you submit a proposal without any references cited, it will not be funded. Um, you need to think about who your audience is here and who's reviewing your proposal. And they are people who publish and they uh, take their clues from um, the published literature. So you need to cite published literature. Um, letters of support are super important, depending on which agency, there's different rules. Um, NSF has a max of three, NIH doesn't have a max. Sometimes your project might involve human subjects. Sometimes your project might involve human subjects slash clinical trial. If you involve people at all, it's human subjects. Uh, a focus group is human subjects. Now it might qualify for an exemption, but you still have to work on your human subjects documents. Uh, and, and I will say, if you get that wrong and you say, we don't have human subjects, but you actually do, reviewers, oh, they love that. They will eat you for breakfast. Um, so make sure if you're not sure to seek out support on that section. Uh, for sure. And just even answering, seek out support and even answering the basic questions, do I need to complete human subject sections? Um, so budgets on NIH are hmm, flexible. Uh, there's ranges that are appropriate for phase one. We talked about, you know, that 250 to $300, $300,000 range is probably where you're going to sit at. Um, but there's a hard cap for NSF at that 256000 um, or maybe, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm going to start saying 259999 since I had to change everything by a dollar on that recent budget. Everybody requires a budget justification. And then if you are working with a research partner, you have to have those routed and approved sub award documents from that university. Uh, on the right, you can see this is just a picture of what um, you're graded with at NIH's landing page for ASSIST, which again is their platform for submission, which I highly recommend. All right, finally, um, you know, I always say about SBIR and SDTR is why not? Um, if, if I had a dollar for every person who said, oh, I don't have time for that, like that takes too long, we're gonna go raise funds with venture capital. And then they come back like a year and a half later and they're like, oh, now we wanna do SBIR. If they would have had it sitting in there the whole time, they would be a year ahead in the process. So even if you're seeking venture capital, and I guarantee you the number one question that those investors are gonna ask you is, have you tried to get non-dilutive funding? And so to be able to say, yes, we have a proposal pending or you know, yes, we have an NIH award, um, it goes a long way. So why not try this as a, a potential avenue for funding? Definitely plan ahead. Um, this, is, this is not for the faint of heart and nothing good happens at the last minute. And um, reviewers are very well versed at recognizing a last minute proposal. Um, even if you don't get funding, I would argue that the whole process is incredibly useful for your team to sort of uh, really plan and think through some of your um, 
strategies and, and plans for either commercializing the technology or even just the development aspects. So it, it's, it's not all for naught. Um, there's definitely value in the process. Also ask for help, like the FAST Center has uh, consultants available. Um, you can apply to receive consulting hours and those folks can help you. And the FAST Center has um, resources on staff who can help you as well. Um, be prepared to fail. This program is all about persistence um, and persistence is rewarded. Uh, but if, if you, you know, come in and just do one submission and don't get it and never pick it up again, um, that, that is a missed opportunity because it really, it, it really is a program of persistence. So keep trying. All right. That's all I have for today. Any other questions? If I have a quick question, if we yep. wanted to move forward, Christine, uh, do we contact you or uh, someone in the SBIR team? Yeah, you contact the FAST Center. So uh, I put the link in the um, in the chat for awesome. applying for one-on-one -on -one assistance. So if you look Perfect. at that link, go there. Okay, so this is for the application to start off the whole process then? Yep, just okay. to register to get you in the system and then we will connect you with some one-on-one -on -one assistance. Perfect, thank you. Hi, Christian. Yes. Yeah. So I have a quick question. So I, I'm planning to submit to NSF. I, my pitch was already like, I got the invitation after uh, submitting my pitch. Great. Um, so is it advisable that if I can discuss my proposal, because it's my first proposal, I have like all the documents are ready. Uh, basically, I can submit any day. I'm waiting for some letters. So is it advisable to like uh, talk to somebody at your team and they can have a look like if something is missing or something something need to be like just to get a perspective. I, highly advisable. Absolutely. The more so, eyes, the better. All right. So um, where should I like, uh, where should I, how should I contact for that? So, so the same thing, if you go to that link in the chat and register, we will get you somebody who can review. Okay. Thank, so just thank in, you. in the chat, I put to everybody the link to, um, Go to the, and it's also on the Illinois FAST website. Uh, there's okay. a, a spot where it says request assistance, but I also put that link in the chat. The, uh, it's on the website, uh, one to one. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Here's, on what, website, isn't it? here's what the form looks like. Oh my God. Can okay. you, I don't know if anybody just heard that. My, teenage son is upstairs playing video games and he just screamed so loud you think somebody was <laughs> okay okay thank you thank sorry you if you heard that i apologize <laughs> christine i just have a quick question yeah um i was wondering just a couple of slides is like required registrations you showed four of them yeah i'm interested in the usda and i'm just wondering if there's any other extra sort of required no. registrations okay they, well, they use grants.gov. So you have to do the four that were on the left. And then you also have to do grants.gov. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. I have a quick question. Um, so I, I know that you probably are already aware of this, but NASA, they do have a technology transfer program where they have um, certain technologies as patent and they're allowing private companies to license those patents. Now, is it, is it okay, like, let's just say they give me the, the license to patent a, pro, a, a technology. Can I go to the SBIR, submit a proposal to receive funding for the development or is that like double dipping or something like that? Or No, I don't think that would be double dipping because you're paying to license the technology. Mm -hmm. um, and the rule is you just have to be in control of the technology um, at time of award. So uh, for example, um, you know, again, using obviously a lot of my work from all my examples comes out of universities. And, and so at a university, um, you know, if somebody makes a discovery in a, a lab and they spin it out to the company and the company is going to license the technology from the university, before they start the project, they have to have negotiated that license agreement. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so that's the only requirement is that you're in control of the technology and have the rights to work on it when you start the work. So I don't think so. Is there more um, a guarantee of approval? Is there a higher approval rate um, since, you know, let's just say my business, they own the patent right now, they own the technology? Um, I don't know that. I don't do a ton of work in NASA um, and don't have experience with that exact scenario. Okay. So I wish I, I wish I had more, a more concrete answer for you, but I don't. No worries. Thank you. You're welcome. Christine, um, I have a quick question um, about the intellectual property, right? So if the idea is new and we have not filed a patent for the idea, right? So if the so if we apply for uh, the development of that idea before we have applied for the patent, um, will that be counted as a public disclosure in that case? Yes, it would be. Um, so that means you have to first file the provisional and then apply. Yeah, now you don't have to have, and while it's a public disclosure, it, it would have to be, Shelly, correct me if I'm wrong, and I should say I'm not an IP attorney, and IP is like so important. So, but you, would, it would have to be discovered by somebody. Like it, the reviewers are bound by a confidentiality agreement, so it wouldn't be considered a public disclosure. But you're at risk. Um, not a great risk. I've never seen anybody lose anything. Shelly, you want to add anything? Uh, no, you're you're correct. You're okay. you are at risk, especially if you're awarded the grant because your abstract is publishable. So your your technique it is a disclosure. But I've never seen anybody um, I've never seen anybody suffer that because you would yeah. have to yeah right. But in the grant, you can write which part are confidential, right? So even if sure. they want to publish the abstract, they cannot. For example, if suppose it's a drug discovery project. Uh, you can say the structure is confidential, for example, right? Because I mean, yes. you are working on one of the areas. Area is always public knowledge. So that aspect is not a problem. But I was talking in more terms of the reviewer. So if the reviewer will see it, it's not a disclosure to public. The reviewers are bound for it to be confidential. They, that's established with the review process. So they're not allowed to disclose anything. Right. So if you write, you know, grant, this part is confidential. Um, it will not consider it as a public um, disclosure. And then once you have the data, you can file for the patent. That should be okay. I, I think so. I, I, again, IP is like, I'm scared to ever comment on it because it's so important. But I'll tell you one I, thing the uh, IP period is critically important in this, in this program and, and at an increasing rate, uh, agencies, NSF really isn't even interested if, if it can't be patented. Um, and that's, that's growing in other agencies too, because of the, they're looking for sort of that, just like any other investor, that long-term opportunity. And they see that that's most possible with, with having, you know, solid IP. And so you. if you haven't filed, when you submit, I would make sure that you are very clear with reviewers that you have a plan to submit, when you're planning to submit that provisional, um, what it's specifically you plan on it covering. And I, I would not be surprised if, if they were to fund you, they would come back and say, what's the status of the IP? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Anything else? You can contact the FAST Center. Shelly put the uh, site in the chat. Um, they have tons of resources. They have tons of other workshops. Um, Shelly has tons of experience in this area as well. So um, it's a solid team and, and I'm sure they can answer any other questions. Yep, feel free to contact us with any further questions. And thank you, Chris, for uh, sharing all this great information. And uh, yeah, just let us know if you have further questions. Be happy to help. Bye everybody.